It's on, yeah. Okay, so now it works. Hello. Uh, thanks a lot to uh, all the great people who invited me here, and uh, especially those who put up the exhibition together. Uh, I was very much challenged by the problems that uh, the, the exhibition poses. Not, it, it doesn't solve them. Uh, and uh, as uh, we would probably agree, uh, the most of the creative work is done at the moment when we pose the problem. The answers and the results might or not come, but they are already there. So the posing uh, of the problem of this exhibition is something that uh, I find quite crucial for the state in which we are producing art today. And I'll try to best, uh, uh, in, in the best possible ways that are at my disposal to answer to these uh, um, ideas and problems that uh, are brought up with the exhibition. Uh, there are several parts of this lecture. The first one, uh, which is a kind of introductory, it's not actually introductory, it's more uh, a sum up of, of a kind of non-elegant sum up of uh, the basic uh, critical premises of uh, a critique of current conditions, of, uh, institutional conditions of the arts that I will try to bluntly put somehow at the beginning or as Bertolt Brecht says with a, a bit of plumpen, uh, plumpensdenken, uh, non-elegant thinking. Uh, and um, uh, afterwards, I will try to uh, think about the ways we can uh, rethink the very apparatuses that we work with. I'm coming from uh, performing arts, but I like to uh, believe that I work with theater. I like the, the other thing is that I like to use the old concepts, uh, and uh, I really believe that I'm doing theater, not performance. P performances are outcomes of what I do in theater, but uh, I'm interested in theater first of all as an apparatus, as a thing that brings together human and non-human agents, material and immaterial agents together and puts them together into a kind of work which might have some consequences. Uh, in the same way as I'm very keen also to translate some of the objects that we produce in that apparatus to other apparatuses, for example, to an apparatus of white box or a cinematic uh, apparatus, which is also um, a part of the ways how we connect material reality with the ideas that we are producing. So uh, I will use the word theater not in terms of theater as a staging of dramatic plays, but theater as a diagram, as an apparatus, or as a machine. But, and, and then uh, I will try also to promote something that I find very crucial for today, since I'm coming from Croatia, and Croatia is one of those countries of, with the economic crisis where these sudden blows of far right and far left are clashing together. Now we are in the phases of far right government. And uh, the first thing that happens is a, a very interestingly complete destroyal of independent culture. The first thing that they do there is to destroy the independent culture. And it's a very significant thing. You know, we have to, just before this lunch, we had a short talk about the, the ways how we work with the right wing governments. And I would say that there is a big difference between conservative rights and populist or neoliberal rights, uh, uh, which are very close to what we uh, remember as fascist rights. And these are the guys who are immediately attacking the cultural fear first institutional and non-institutional, they don't care for culture, they just know that this produces a loud voice against them. And that's what happens now in Croatia. And that's why I will argue from that position that one of the most important things that we should do is to construct institutions. Uh, 
because the institutions are something that holds on after the practices, and I will try to argument here that the constitution, that institutions are not infrastructural objects only, but first of all temporal objects, objects which uh, hold on in time, that have their own rhythms, they hardly disappear after a while, they're, they're, they have difficulties in terms of changing, but they are rhythmical appearances of specific procedures, practices, and ideas which uh, might happen something to hold on, or at least for, to hold on for a while. So first, blunt description where we are. We might agree or not, but that's how we, I will open. So, uh, I, and I will read for the sake of translators, because uh, it might be a hard work to follow every word of mine uh, and to translate it in time, so I will try to read and they have a text and uh, I will make it as live as possible. So the phenomenon of, uh, phenomenon of aestheticization, it didn't start well. Uh, the phenomenon of aestheticization of artistic labor where the artist becomes less and less present by her artworks and more with her labor is nowadays promoted by various cultural institutions whose mission is no longer production of art, but rather reproduction of consumer relations with the work of artists. Art institutions no longer figure as disciplinary instances whose task is to take care of artists and production of artworks just like the milk industry of today, whose purpose is not to produce the best, but rather the most wanted yogurt. Art institutions today no longer produce works of art to present it to the public, who then has the opportunity to valorize it. Rather, valorization itself is being reproduced and exchanged. Curatorial turn in performing arts, and I will mostly focus on performing arts institutions, but it is very much similar to what happens in art institutions in general. So curatorial turn in performing arts, appearance of a new role of a curator at the place of artistic director or programmer, intends to result in a particular care for a spectator instead of poetic projection. Several decades of intensive care paid to spectators who have passed through various phases from observers to participants and then, then emancipated spectators finally resulted in the shift towards their subjectification. While producers and programmers used to talk about their artists in the previous institutions that we remember from 80s, curators talk about their audience. This type of transforming artistic labor into a product can no longer be called work or process. It is rather a social production or reproduction of conditions and modes of production, a kind of a realism of production relations. Louis Althusser would say that social production is only apparently the production of things. In reality, it is the production of a social relation the de reproduction of the relations of production. Tendency to reproduce artistic labor as an alternati alternative to production of artworks with the claim or aim to destabilize a fetish of objects has actually turned into a fetishization of process, where the so-called free, non-alienated artistic labor became usable good. Because they represent processes, Art institutions no longer separate spheres of circulation. They also produce conditions of production and distribution and references, and finally, or initially, desire and consummation. And this is the point where the final level of so-called aesthetic revolution manifests itself, or aesthetic turn that uh, Ranciere talks about. According to Ranciere, the aesthetic revolution has replaced the regime of representation. By abandoning its representative role, institutions have undertaken the role of regulators of the new regime, an aesthetic regime in which art is art to the extent that it is something else than art. Institutions thus, uh, institution thus becomes aestheticized institution, operating in the sphere of service economy 
and its contemporaneity lies in simultaneous production and consumption, which is a description of service economy, simultaneous production and consumption. Institution is then turned into a place where credit invades art, as Jacques Camate foresaw already in 1977 for Bobur. Institution is a place of promise and not production, and everything is possible, just like in the world of capital. To quote Kamate, when execution is replaced by credit, by a blank check, art finds itself reduced to derisory size and, at the extreme, disappears. It disappears by becoming almost the opposite idea. Art institution can be an anticipation of politics today, of society, it can anticipate life, and finally, it can be an anticipation of art. Why not? In such institution, the artist is indebted, and she knows her debt. However, her debt no longer belongs to the sphere of creativity, but needs to be verified in something that is its opposite idea. Artist, may I ask just somebody, some, something is blowing here. I don't know, is it the right wing or, <laughs> but it blows uh, and it goes through my ear. So if it's possible just to turn it off for a while, it would be great. So artist labor has to be presented and art has to be produced from art and artist in a manner amenable to capital, Kamate would say. For what matters is to touch the mass of human beings, otherwise there would be no realization of art, who still haven't internalized capital's lifestyle, who are still more or less bound to certain rhythms, practices, superstitions, and who, even if they have taken up the vertigo of the capital's rhythm of life, don't necessarily utilize its image, and therefore live a contradiction or jarring, and are constantly exposed to future shock, says Kamate. Institution must become a factory, but not a factory of works of art or interruptions. It has to be a factory of continuity, of labor, or production, or rather anti-production, or anti-production. Production incorporating dislocation, distribution, and consummation is nothing new in the world of capitalism. This symptom was defined as early as in Marx's Grundrisse, whereas Deleuze and Gattari named it anti-production in anti-Oedipus, or interpreted by Steven Zepke, quote, anti-production works through all the mechanisms that prevent or recoup creative excess, whether by refusing funding or support or by rewards that integrate it into the flows of a capital. In this sense, anti-production is not the opposition of production, but rather supports and develops it. As a result, the greater visibility, prosperity, and integration enjoyed by the arts today doesn't mean they have more creative freedom, just the opposite. Contemporary artistic practice marks a particular low point in creativity and insurrectionary spirit, not least because resistance is now aggressively marketed as one of art's selling points. So, so much about rigid, non-elegant thinking about institutions and how we are produced. Why theater? Reflections on the transformation of the theatrical dispositive have evolved for centuries on the boundary between the viewer and the stage by exploring the possibility of its bridge, transfer, dislocation, or position exchange. The basic premise of this logic has been the mirroring reflective logic of theater. Thus, even Artaud's radical intervention has merely been an inversion of the dual relation, since it, posit uh, since it posited theater as a generator and the world as its reflection. Thus understood, theater is an art that shows itself to the viewer, and all attempts at changing this image of theater have been an attempt at changing the viewer's function, whereby the viewer has always been understood as someone external to theater. However, the manifestation of theater has rarely been discussed, the very manifestation of theater. Namely, that theater always, 
already includes the viewers and their viewing. Even during the rehearsals, when the viewing is merely supposed and theater happens before the unborn spectator. The event of theater, unlike its show, has rather refractive than reflective character. And that refraction occurs precisely on the membrane that separates its two different local manifestations, whereby the style of existence of its participants changes as well. It is theater as the institutional relationship between the audience or public and the artists and producers on one side, and theater as a poetic set or conjuncture of viewers and actors in performance, living and non-living. However, I'm not referring to refraction as an effect of one idea passing through two different media or two different ideologies. It is more adequate to think of it as a deflection in the style of existence of theater's agents, the viewers and the artists, resulting from an encounter on the membrane between the institution of theater and poetics of theater. In this duality, theater realizes its power of refraction. It is now materially factual, and thus the world doesn't see itself only in theater, but also through theater which makes theater a polygon par excellence for reflecting on social objects, its parallel involvement in social processes, as well as the ways of separating from them. Theater always resembles other social processes and differs from them at the same time. Nevertheless, it is becoming increasingly difficult to maintain this dual status owing to the transformations in the modes of production. Understanding theater as a medium per se has always been an uncanny thought to me, primarily because theater is a place in which the basic disturbances in communication, such as noise, uh, uh, retardation, redundancy, play a creative role. Today, it may even be of importance to re-emphasize the difference between creation and communication. Thereby, I do not mean to say that there is no mediation or communication in theater. On the contrary, if theater is a place of potential encounters, then the process of theater is a performance of translation between contacting, contacting problematics, coordinate system, referential frameworks, contexts, discursive universes, regimes of tension, and modes of existence. So theater is a kind of uh, uh, place of potential encounters, as uh, uh, Louis Althusser would say. Theater forever immersed in the media environment is a mediator in the sense in which Bruno Latour has differentiated between mediator, mediators and intermediaries. And he says, to quote, an intermediary in my vocabulary is what transports meaning or force without transformation. Defining its inputs is enough to define, to define its outputs. Mediators, on the other hand, cannot be counted as just one. They might count for one, for nothing, for several, or for infinity. Their input is never a good predictor of their output. Their specificity has to be taken into account every time. Mediators transform, translate, distort and modify the meaning or, or the elements they are supposed to carry. And here we should remember probably the understanding of the concept or the, the, the position of a translator in Walter Benjamin's writing, where he says that translation from one language to another is not about finding the uh, exact uh, uh, words in another language for the original words, but uh, in the ways how to change the uh, language into which we translate in the same way as the creator of poetry changed her own language while writing it. So. Uh, when we talk about translation here, it's not in uh, uh, linguistic terms, translation from one system of science to another, but more in Euclidean uh, logics of uh, geometry from one coordinate system to another, where you move one object from one language to, or from one coordinate system to another, and you have to shift coordinate system for the object to appear again. 
may just bluntly to say like if you move an object from theater to cinema you have to change cinema for the theater to appear or opposite if you want to change from cinema and move cinematic object translated to theater theater has to change for the object to stay cinematic Understanding theater as a mediator instead of a mere in intermediary implies that it is not a mechanism transferring the interpretation of an external author or authority. Its mode of functioning is interpretation if interpretation is understood as translation as well as agency, because in Latin, interpres is also agent and translator. As refraction rather than mere reflection. Such translation implies the creation of a composite, and in Diderot's theater that composite was tableau, in Brecht's theater it was gestus, in Artaud's it was hieroglyph, in Beckett's it was breath, and its capacity exceeds above all the pure function of translating a clear message or, meeting, or meaning. In Roland Barthes' words, these examples of decoupage or what I would call composites here, are, quote, erecting a meaning, but manifesting the production of that meaning. So let me skip into something that is crucial for the logic of the ways of the working of theatrical apparatus. And these are the chronologics of theater. How much? Oh, OK, I still have some time. In spite of the fact that the specific questions about the role of institutions in the process of alienation of artistic work were thematized primarily from the perspective of visual arts, the real drama of legitimization has played out over the last decade in performing arts field through numerous ongoing debates about the status of artistic labor, the status of artworks, artistic practice, discourse, and political subjectivation within the framework of particular temporal logics, or I would call them here chronologics. The despotism of capital imposed over the temporality of artistic work is meticulously elaborated by Bojana Kunst in her book Artist at Work, and her idea of projective temporality, temporality which is a temporality of the artistic work in which by doing a project we are never in the present but always in a kind of futurity of the project. We are defining our procedures by the promise of the final end, but the final end never really matters because the project is never realized. We are always over the deadline and there is always that period of kind of zombie life of the work which uh, uh, exceeds the time of the deadline. So we are always dead when we finish the project somehow or we pass that border of, 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 of the deadline. So. Uh, I really suggest uh, the reading of that book uh, for the understanding the idea of the conditions of temporality of the artistic production. However, the totalizing image of time would be incomplete if we were to understand it as a cross-section view of our present. And the difficulty is in understanding the present as our common present. Time flows, but the flow is not linear. Our biological time is not identical to the time of our labor, and that is the first sign of friction within the representation of time. Theater always happens within some measured time, but also within an experiential time. It always happens in some historical moment, but also in present. Theater has the capacity not only to reflect, but to produce time. It is always in some instrumental time, and it, it is itself an operation in time. The machinic character of theater, its capacity to be a diagram of time, to take time in order to present some particular image of time and to temporize space, opens a possibility for theater to produce interruptions in time as well. So I, I'm, I like to understand theater as an apparatus or as a diagram temporal diagram of space. When we want to present time, we always use spatial ways. So we either draw the line and we give it an orientation, or we do calendars, we, we spatialize time. But the question is, is there anything that can help us to temporalize 
the, the idea uh, of space. And I would say the theater is a kind of diagram, or we can understand it as a diagram of spatial and material uh, uh, logics and developments. And it is precisely these interruptions that are essential if we are trying to destabilize or at least disclose the, the, the determining and totalizing fiction of causality between the time of work and the, and the biological time of our life. Chronologics that interest me are grounded in the rejection of a univocal image of contemporaneity, especially one founded in the idea of our present. So my present is not the same as Xavier's present. It's not the same as a present of artists working in India, in uh, Beirut, in uh, South America, and so on. So we live different presents, and our, but we are in a possibility to be contemporaneous, not in, ter in terms of contemporaneity being defined as a reaction to the present, but bringing many different temporalities together. So if that's, uh, in a way, uh, derived from Peter Osborne's understanding of uh, contemporaneity of big exhibitions and art productions today. But I would somehow say that this logic of contem contem contemporaneity of different agents in theater is also affect. The temporality of the audience is not the same as the temporality of performers and the objects which are there on stage, and the, the time that remains till the end of the performance, and the time of repetition, etc., etc. So, artistic work is dispersed, it happens in various rhythms, it has its compressions, moments of recapitulation, slowing down, gradual eliminations, unfoldings, each part of the process is a singular time set, and it has an operative function or is the outcome of the operation itself. These time sets are discrete units within the same operative territory, but they are at the same time outcomes of different genealogies. Such idea of time doesn't imply a systematic operation or systemic operation, but rather it implies multiple unit operations, as Ian Bogost would call them. All the elements within the logics of more or less forced chance encounters that we condition in theater do touch and converge and hold on within these newly established relations for at least a while. Whether through the logic of development or the logic of repetition, but neither development nor repetition determine the totality. Instead of research that aims towards the completion of work, whose realization will be defined by its presentability, or to put it more, more precisely by a specific state in which the work has another life, as well as purpose outside itself, this research aims at the beginnings of the things. So how the things begin? How can we condition beginnings and affinities for the beginnings? And in our work, I will just mention a few examples of what we were busy with. How do, for example, body, movement, and technology meet in the cinematic choreography of the workers leaving the Lumiere factory uh, when the very first film was shot, when they did three different repetitions of the first very, very first film, and each time uh, making more and more efficient workers uh, leaving the factory? or how the exclusion of a parallel artificial gesture uh, in Delsart's theory of bodily expression in rhetorics coincides with the ideology of natural body in early modern dance, or how algorithm, algorithmic tools introduce non-human, counterintuitive logics in human movement, or how industrial serial, serialized production of goods corresponds to the serial logic of choreography that we can find in slapstick movies, for example, in the 20s, but also in Soviet movies at the time of new uh, economical politics of the Soviet uh, state, when they were uh, reintroducing the logics of slapstick into the movement uh, uh, in, in uh, critical cinema of Soviets. 
all those small sets, and these I would call sets, sets of, or conjunctures, uh, uh, can be variedly dislocated and can create operative connections to other similar and divergent sets. Theater is an apparatus, a special machine made of a different metal, a structure of small discrete units, none of which are either dominant or superfluous. A machine is more complex than a tool of mechanism, which are always unidirectional. And Althusser describes an apparatus, and I prefer that one, sorry, to post-structuralists. The dictionary definition also says that in the ensemble of elements, none is superfluous. On the contrary, or uh, all are perfectly well adapted to their end, insofar as all are parts of the articulated whole designated as the apparatus. This therefore presupposes a sort of mechanism in which all the parts, all the wheels and cogs, work together to the same end, which is obviously external to the apparatus. If it were not, the apparatus would not be separate. So the theater is thus an ensemble of discrete sets that have their own temporal determinations, complex temporal structures, or complex chronologics, but whose mutual encounters, deflections, and junctures also have temporal determinations of their own. And here, we should ask ourselves the crucial question of what I would say is uh, a question of uh, this presentation, and that's how the work works, and not how the work produces meaning, or how to interpret the work, but how the work works. I will go back, I will look back for a while, back to Althusser, and his text about the performance that he had seen, uh, performance was called El Nost Milan, it's a performance by Giorgio Streller, uh, he had seen it uh, in Paris, and he commends that performance as something that becomes complete just by its own logic of incompletion, because it, not, it doesn't center anything into a perspective of the viewer, but works on the logic of dislocation of its own procedures. And he says, I look back, and I'm suddenly and irresistibly assailed by the question, are not these few pages, in their groping way, simply that unfamiliar play El Nost Milan, performed on a June evening, pursuing in me its incomplete meaning, searching in me, despite myself, now that all the actors and sets have been cleared away for the advent of its silent discourse. And this silent discourse of the performance, which is not complete, is something that he finds as something that holds on after the performance. Let's focus for a while on the act of looking back, the same act that Althusser appoints to finish writing his afterthoughts on George Ostreller's performance of 1962, whose conclusions in a way announce his radical conception of aleatory materialism. Uh, in his late writing, he developed the conception of uh, aleatory materialism as something that is a critique of dialectical method of Marx, claiming that by the uh, aleatoric encounters actually things change and something held on, something stayed after that. And only with the recapitulation and nachdenken or afterthought we can uh, uh, explain why these things happened, but that's something that we couldn't uh, could, that, that nobody could predict. So Althusser looks back in time. He goes back to the logic of time of the performance. The silent discourse of the incomplete work, as opposed to the open work, appears in time and not in space, appears in a form of recapitulation. Because, to quote Althusser, if the object of theater is to set in motion the immobile, the eternal sphere of the illusory, illusory consciousness, a mythical world, then a play is really the development, the production of the new consciousness in the spectator, incomplete like any other consciousness. But moved by this incompletion itself, 
the distance achieved this inexhaustible work of criticism in action. The performance is really the production of a new spectator, an actor who starts where the performance ends, who only starts so as to complete it, but in life. The completion of the performance starts, I would say, post hoc, as an afterthought, as nachdenken. As a principle, I would emphasize here the permanent condition of incompletion. Incompletion as a general principle of creation through interruption. That principle doesn't begin from that of necessity. The principle that the segments of a theatrical process stem from necessity. Rather, they become necessary. Every encounter and thus also every set of relations in the process might not have taken place, uh, although it did take place. All encounters are aleatory and their effects random. Therefore, their determinations may not be assigned except by working backwards. Our domain of work is to detect affinities that did or would enable a conjuncture to take hold affinities made it necessary. And that is what theater examines in its process. What kind of conditions and affinities of its actants enable a particular conjuncture to take hold on various levels of existence among its actants, in the world of objects, in relations to fictions, in repertoire, in history, etc. So, uh, let me just be very practical about that method. So that's something that uh, is, uh, a lo is already organized through the logic of operation uh, in time and operation in, uh, with the objects that the theater produces. So, in the process of development of the method which we in Bedco named together with our friends who started the whole process with us, post hoc dramaturgy, we asked ourselves the following question. How does a work work? So, no, not how, does, how, how do we produce the work, how do we make the work, but how does the work, when it's produced and presented, works? To begin, we made a chronological sketch of roughly three operating stages of the traditional mode of working on a performance. The first stage would be so-called poetic or production dramaturgy stage, encompassing various operations of generating and accumulating performance material. The second stage, which we call the dramaturgy of the final cut, is predicated on decision-making procedures regarding presentability in which the functions of dramaturgy relate mostly to editing, so-called external eye reflection, verifying the feasibility of the premises of the performance, etc. The third stage, and this is the stage I'm talking about, is when the artwork is presented for interpretative analysis from its authorial intentions to the meanings it produces. Still, our interest lies neither in authorial intentions nor the production of meaning, but in the operative aspect of the performance, in which key parameters are, first, identification of actors involved in the operations, whether they be performers, spectators, presenters, the public, inhuman actors, etc. The second, mobilization procedures. How do we work? What mobilizes? What, and how the work mobilizes? the atmosphere, the intensities of performance, subjectivation of the spectators, exhaustion, boredom, mediation, reading, etc. The third, performance format, a play, interventions, durational performance, series of performances, just to mention some of the objects that we worked on. And in the end, but not uh, unimportant, translative units. Situations, interventions into reality, micro-events, etc. Departing from those parameters, we specified several objects, or, or as I've dubbed them here, sets, that in different performances imply different procedures with their specific spatial-temporal operations. And then 
we try to understand how they come together, how can we translate one from, uh, from, from one, uh, what I called, uh, uh, coordinate system to another? How can we take one of these objects from theater to another dispositive, which is, for example, white cube? Uh, in a the theater, we have with the black, within the black box, if we are working in the black box, a situation of something that is immer immersive, situation of bringing things together, putting them together. Change in the gallery walls from the white to the black, you will see the result. With the white cube, you have a completely different situation when you put this object. White cube introduces separation between the things, or at least it produces a potential of separation. And that the potentiality of separation is something that then, once translated to another apparatus, and it's an apparatus of cinema, changes completely the logic of cinema by introducing these objects as something that becomes small sets that you work with and that you uh, try to present in another logic. And I will show you briefly an example how it happened to us. So just to skip a detailed description of how this kind of method uh, might um, be um, uh, exemplified on a very concrete work. We can come to that some, sometimes later on or tomorrow or next year. Um, but to go back the, to the problem of, um, of, the, uh, the, of the analysis. Also, uh, although it looks like an attempt at systematization, post hoc intends no systemic analysis. Rather, it is an attempt to use an exploded view of the work and its operation to generate new pragmata that would be above all geared toward poetics of knowledge and by extension toward responsible artistic practices that would be open to the vicissitudes of their conditions of production, which is an important political issue, if not also a fundamental political premise of all theater. Still, it is evident that, that, above all, such an approach would have to reject the traditional logic of the chronological division of the process which I introduced some time ago, in favor of approaching it in terms of diagrams and recapitulations, opening the possibility that the process lasts for as long as it takes to establish a new image of time, whereas situations of presentation should be only interruptions in their durations, markers of time. The principle of incompletion implicates not an endless processuality, neither a lack, but interruption. And in that regard, I would invoke two metaphors that are crucial for our work. One of them is, uh, OK, thank you. One of them is exploded view. So the idea of a small explosion within the object which separates elements and then gives an idea of how the work works. And the other is interstice or the, that empty space that is well described in Deleuze's uh, theory of cinema, specifically Godard's uh, uh, theory of cut, uh, as a space which by this junction brings things together. So to close. The gap separates, but it is also factual. By separating, it brings together and leaves room for thematizing what is otherwise invisible, abstract, and enters meaning vertically. Every set of a process, its every operating segment, results from an interruption, not from a culmination. Sets are a sort of gestures, which may be separated and stand on their own. Nor is the premiere the moment when the process is at its maximum, after which it is all but repetition. Rather, it is a moment of interruption, a point where another conjuncture of actants, abstractions, and real effects, more accurately, another series, enters into a relationship with the performance through a non-relationship with it. Unlike functional analysis that normatively begin by assuming that there are rules for organizing conjunctures, our premise is that once a conjuncture is established, its elements play by the rules, stick to the laws, but laws are haunted by radical instability. The perspective of our analysis comprises not the laws, but the radical instability of the conjuncture. Our art always has its consequences, but they are impossible to predict. 
However, we can always work on the affinities, which is a key epistemological issue in theater. So for an artistic act to take charge, to enter the sphere of politics and ethics as an object, as a fact, it must qua res become res gesta, as Agamben describes how a simple fact becomes an event. The final cut undertaking has to be understood literally as a cut, as an interruption in the way Benjamin understands the functionality of the gesture, something that has a beginning and the end. An interruption initiates a different sort of movement, that of the afterthought, the disjunctive movement of Nachdenken. In performance studies, uh, most of the writers who try to explain the temporality of the performance uh, uh, emphasized the ephemerality of the performance, ex exclusive existence in the present and becoming true vanishing. And here I would claim that the logic of interruption is a logic of focusing into the infrastructure of the performance, specifically temporal infrastructure of the performance, and that this logic of interruption is not a logic of uh, disappearance, but of refocusing towards the material consequences of the performance in the very apparatus of theater or any other apparatus where we move our reflection. So with uh, the changing uh, temporality and logic of temporality, we can create the theater of radical deceleration, one where the calendar, clock, working hours, lifetime, duration, spatial temporal compression, timeless time, operating time, the time that remains, and all of those metaphors and time images that we confronted in the last few decades are articulations of operating states and expressions of interruptions in the dominant images of time. If we would like to institute some of them, we have to think about the institutions as moments of interruption and not only as moments of continuity. And that's where the radical responsibility of the curator uh, is. This small difference in power of the curator in the moments of representation is a power not of interpretation, but the power of translation through the thematization of the very relationship of the institution, its temporality, and the logics of rhythmization of the work and artistic production. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I just wanted to show you a short um, video of the example of what I mean by translating the uh, from, from an object to object. Seat or? But it should come up. Sorry, this is. Okay. So this is a very new thing. It's the, the, the material that you see is not yet finished, but this is an installation that we are uh, working on right now that will be presented uh, this month at the Venice Biennial, in, uh, at the Architectural Biennial. So, uh, oh no, no, you are not seeing that. <laughs> I'm seeing that thing, sorry. Why? What? Why does it happen now? Yeah, but uh, it doesn't show up. I'm trying to change it, but no, it's not the second screen. It was showing before the.
sorry for this, but uh, ah, here it comes. So uh, we did a performance which was called uh, one poor and one zero, in which we uh, worked on a reenactment of the very first film ever made, Workers Living Lumiere Factory in Lyon. So uh, we were challenged by the very si first situation of the film, uh, show, uh, showing people leaving the factory. The, so the first filmmakers are in the same time owners of the factory, and what they do in the three steps of making the first movie, they choreograph their wor workers to manage to leave in the time of the length of the first film reel, you know, so in the uh, 50 seconds. So the first one is very chaotic, the second one even more to show the effect of moving pictures, and in the third one uh, they manage to live in time of the 50 seconds with the gate opening and the gate closing. And this editing procedure became very similar to the cutting out of unnecessary movement material in choreography of the work, uh, work at the assembly lines at the time uh, uh, in the factories. And um, uh, what we did was that we uh, made a performance where we thematized that situation, another situation of a film by Vlado Kristl, German and Croatian cinema maker, experimental cinema maker, who choreographed the whole film by running with a bucket through uh, a city and having film extras running behind him. And then he re-edited the material, the, the whole footage, into a film about the revolution. So revolutionary film extras fighting against the director. Uh, after the making of the performance, we went to the three factories uh, in Croatia, and we created a kind of um, um, hybrid film set in which we paid the film extras to be to perform spectators in a similar manner as uh, in the ancient uh, Greek theater, people were paid to go to see theater. So trying to understand the logics of audience figures, evaluation through the logics of audience, we had a kind of chance to have paid spectators to be in the same time engaged to watch, but to play audience and to be together with the regular audience. And in three different theaters, we were restaging these situations from three different films. In, the, in one of the cities, they were paid to block the entrance into the uh, uh, theater, in the second, to perform participative theater, and in the third, to sleep, just to sleep for eight hours. So all of these actions then translated into a situation of restaging parts of the performances, which we became a part of the film set, and in the video installation, which you cannot really now collect the whole material because these are, it will be three channel video installation properly screened with three screens, so separated images. Uh, we would like to thematize these three logics, how the work leaves the factory and opens the field for going out to the factory. Then the second, how the participation introduces a new logic of unpaid labor of spectating. And the third, how the logics of deactivation through being paid for uh, uh, being extra in the process might challenge the logic of the work of the performance. And just as a small example of how the units could be translated and how this produces at the very situation there between the audience and those who are paid a discussions, which now you can see on the second screen, the discussion between extras and experts that we invited to discuss about the institutions plus artists, where extras somehow decided to discuss and to take part in the problematization of the very situation of audience watching institutional organization and whom the culture is for. So I spent all my time, I think, even for the questions. Muchas gracias, Sergey. <laughs> Claro, pero la gente puede salir si quiere. Pero, 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 pero.